Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're ready to start session five on macroeconomics and epidemiology. The first paper is titled COVID-19 is also a reallocation shock. And the presenting author is Steve Davis. Okay, have I succeeded in sharing my screen or not? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Okay. Tells me I have to grant privacy access. <laughs> Which I've done many times before. I'm not sure why it's asking me that now. Steven, just to save time, this is Anna. I can uh, pull up your slides if you've sent them. Yes, I have. Okay, give me two seconds. Okay. <clears throat> I'm trying, as you try, I'm trying. Oh, Steve, I think you got there first. All right, great. Great, great. okay. So um, this is joint work with uh, Jose Maria Barrero and Nick Bloom. Um, we are delighted to uh, be part of uh, what's really been an outstanding uh, Brookings program. Um, so the, uh, the thesis of this paper is stated in the title, okay? So uh, um, to use the word unprecedented again, you know, we've had an unprecedented uh, contraction in economic activity with interesting demand and supply elements. Um, the focus of this paper is though on another aspect of the COVID-19 shock and that's the reallocation aspect. The paper provides uh, multiple types of um, anecdotal and systematic evidence uh, to try to flesh out uh, this reallocation shock or the reallocation aspects of the shock. Uh, in my remarks today, I will focus on five types of systematic evidence. Uh, the first bullet point speaking to the short-term reallocative aspects uh, of the shock and pretty much the near-term wake of the pandemic. Point two is about the large share of uh, pandemic-induced layoffs that are likely to be uh, permanent in the sense that the job losers don't return to their old jobs. Um, I'll then turn to some evidence on uh, the work from home phenomenon uh, both uh, trying to quantify the magnitude of the existing shift to work from home, uh, but then more novelly, um, providing evidence on the uh, anticipated post-pandemic shift in working from home relative to uh, the situation before the pandemic. And then perhaps the most novel um, methodological piece of the paper, not necessarily the most important evidence, is we're going to use firm level forecast of their own outcomes to construct forward-looking measures of uh, job reallocation and uh, sales reallocation. And then I'll briefly talk about some uh, uh, evidence on the stock from the stock market before turning to uh, policy implications. So Nick and I are involved with a team at the Atlanta Fed that fields a monthly survey of business expectations called the su uh, Survey of Business Uncertainty. We also use this survey uh, to field timely questions on topics of interest. Here's a, uh, two special questions we asked in the April SBU. Um, we asked the panelists in our firm, and these are senior executives in, in the businesses. Um, we'd like to ask you about how developments related to the coronavirus are affecting staffing levels at your firm. We asked them this question in mid, in mid April. We asked them to go back to, uh, to the beginning since um, March one. And then we, we asked them also to look forward over the next four weeks. And we had five response categories that you can see written at the, near the bottom of this slide covering temporary layoffs and furloughs, permanent layoffs and, and so on. So let me start by drawing some evidence from this, um, from this, the answers to this question. The first is really just a kind of a validation to see whether our answers make any sense. And so if we take the uh, results from the survey, uh, they imply a, a roughly 14% drop in employment from March 1 uh, through mid-May. And that's very similar to the, uh, the, the paper that, uh, is that than what's found in the ADP-based paper that uh, John Grigsby presented earlier today for continuing firms over the same time period. So that gives us some comfort that our sample is at least tracking the current outcomes. Now, one thing we could do, because we asked about gross new hires of these firms, uh, permanent layoffs, temporary layoffs, is we could calculate uh, how many new hires there were during this time period from March 1 to mid-May uh, relative to the number of layoffs. So of course, we all know now there are tens of millions of layoffs. Um, uh, there were three new hires for each one of these layoffs during this period. 
Um, and I think we were the first kind of to put that fact on the table. Since then, there have been other pieces of information that have uh, kind of come to bear from other data sources that reinforce that. And, um, and I, I think in fact suggest there are even more hires were occurring during that period. So we can now draw on JOLTS data for March and April where we see uh, 4.3 hires for every 10 layoffs, gross hiring rates in JOLTS, weekly business formation data from census administrative records also show lots of hiring activity. So point one is there were a lot of hiring activities even in the midst of the uh, massive layoffs and um, enormous contraction that we experienced during that time period. Now we were also interested in, in uh, what fraction of these job losses uh, were permanent and what fraction were temporary. So we asked firms uh, to make that division of the data. In the, in the SBU data, the firms themselves, as of mid-April, uh, mid uh, perceived 23% of these layoffs uh, to be permanent. Um, just an ind independently, there was a Washington Post Ipsos poll that came out uh, a couple of weeks after our survey of persons that got the same 23% job loss number. And then just in the last few days, there this California policy lab data that has come up at least twice earlier today. This is probably the high, the best uh, quality piece of information. Uh, and it's basically, it turns out California, when you apply for a claim uh, for unemployment benefits, they ask you, do you think your layoff is temporary, permanent? And they also allow you to say unknown. That also generates 23%. You can try to generate this uh, permanent uh, layoff share of job losses in the CPS. I don't think the CPS is particularly well suited to do that. You need to make strong assumptions. Um, we've done that in the appendix of the paper, but I think the, the first three sources I mentioned are better suited. I'm gonna go forward with that 23% permanent layoff share as perceived at the time the response, uh, the, uh, the survey response or the initial filing. Now, historically, many layoffs um, that were seen as temporary when they happened uh, turn out to be permanent after the fact. And uh, here we rely on two historical, two studies using different data, different methods, and very different time periods. One from Katz and Meyer, and one um, based on work by uh, Fujita and Moscarini. So what these data, what these studies provide for us is the fraction of layoffs that were perceived as temporary that turned out to be temp, uh, temporary ex post. That was 72% in the Katz and Meyer study and 87.5% uh, in the Fujita Moscarini study. And then they also tell us what fraction of layoffs that were perceived as permanent when they happened turned out to, to actually be temporary. So if we take those historical uh, experiences and we apply, apply them to the 23% permanent layoff share that's perceived at the time the layoff happened, we get uh, a projection of realized uh, permanent layoff shares of 32 to 42%. Now, if you think about that in connection with the tens of millions of um, uh, layoffs as measured in UI claims, uh, you very quickly get to something on the order of 10 million or more permanent layoffs uh, in the last, uh, you know, since the, since the crisis really took off in, in mid-March. Mid so we think that's an important fact to keep in mind. There are many workers who lost jobs and they aren't coming back. Uh, that's the central point that we wanna take away from that analysis. Now, we've got two, two sources of survey evidence um, on working from home. Um, one is a survey of US residents uh, that we conducted. Um, we sampled 2,500 adults who earned more than 20,000 in 2019 and we ask them about their current work status. And you can see that in the black bars on this chart. And then we also weighted those responses by their earnings, okay? And those are the red, the red bars. And so if I just pick out the fraction of people who were working and earning at least 20,000 in 2019, who are working from home now, it's 50% on an earnings weighted basis, about 42% on an unweighted basis. If we take those numbers and adjust for the people who aren't working at all, what we find is that currently, and this is as of late May, 62% of all labor services in the US economy, according to this survey, are being supplied at home. And two thirds of labor services on an earnings weighted basis are being supplied at home. So the point there is 
that's just evidence of how massive this social and economic experiment is in working from home. Now, ultimately, we want to know what's going to happen after the pandemic's over. And here we go back to the survey of business uncertainty, uh, May, the May wave of this, <clears throat> where we asked questions of businesses both about um, how, how much of their workforce was working um, uh, at, uh, at home uh, before the pandemic uh, in 2019. And there we paralleled questions from the American Time Use Survey and how much do they think or do they expect we'll be working from home after the pandemic is over? You can see on this slide that um, we get very similar answers uh, to 2019 to what uh, the American Time Use Survey found in 2017 and 2018, which is pretty comfortable. The bottom line number according to both these sources is something like five to five and a half percent of all full work days were done at home before the pandemic. After the pandemic, businesses tell us that they think it's gonna triple relative to that five and a half percent number. So that's equivalent to taking one tenth of all full work days and shifting them from business premises to home. Now, if you disaggregate our results, which we talk about in the paper, and you focus on office worker days, what we find there is one fifth of all office worker days will shift from business premises to home or coffee shops for that matter uh, after the pandemic is over. And that we think has potentially very important implications for worker spending power inside the business districts of cities because that's where a lot of office workers work. Now, turning to the forward looking measures of reallocation. So each month, month we ask these uh, business executives to forecast their own firm's outlook for jobs and sales at a one-year look-ahead horizon. And then we use those to construct what is essentially a forward-looking excess reallocation rate that is the analog to what John and I and Dunn Roberts and Samuelson did with respect to excess reallocation of jobs. And many other studies have used these measures, but always in a backward-looking sense. We use them in a forward-looking sense. So here's what we found, um, and whoops, um, you see the averages here for these forward-looking uh, rates, and these are expressed as a percentage of employment before the pandemic struck and in the last three months of our sample. Now, we have a rotation scheme in our sample. Uh, each firm, there's kind of a three-month rotation scheme. So we're actually using different firms to respond in April, May, and June. And we have a modest size sample, so we're trying to mi minimize the... Uh, maximize the sample there. Basically what you see here is according to firms, they expect uh, in aggregate, the reallocation rate of jobs and sales to double for jobs and roughly uh, quintuple uh, for sales compared to what uh, was going on before the pandemic. Now in terms of stock returns, you know, the reason we looked at stock returns is not because it's the perfect measure, but we can go back far in time. So here we're taking firm level data on stock returns and we're calculating uh, the interquartile range of the valuated distribution of firm level equity returns from the last trading day on one month to the last trading day on another month. And basically what you see here is this episode we've just gone through stands out as one of the major stock market value reallocation um, episodes in the last uh, 30 years or so. Now. Briefly, why you should expect some of this to persist, and I'm going to I'm going to run short of time here, but I want to make three points, um, and I'll summarize what's on this slide. First, we've engaged in these massive experiments with respect to working from home, consumer spending pattern, and business practices, especially with respect to travel. There's been both learning by doing that makes us more effective at those things, and should lead us to expect that they'll continue. There's also been experimentation, so that we've learned in some cases that working from home works better than we think. On top of that, there have been complementary investments by the businesses in making things like working from home and virtual customer meetings, meetings work. On top of that, there's been complementary innovation incentives. You can think companies like Facebook are trying to make these platforms better. And then lastly, it's, not a, it's also important to note that in some areas at least, the COVID pandemic has knocked down regulations that had previously inhibited a shift from in-person to virtual interactions. And I think the most important example I'm aware of in this regard is the delivery of healthcare services, uh, where you know, virtual medicine is taking off, mainly because of changes in Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement practices. Now, on policy messages, 
Our chief message here is that there are many elements of the US policy response to the landscape and legacy features of the US policy landscape that will impede the reallocation of jobs, workers, and capital, and in doing so will slow the recovery. We talk about several categories of these policies um, in the paper. Since I'm only got a minute left, I'm gonna to turn to just one example that I think um, really illustrates uh, some ways in which the initial policy response was in our view off the mark. And that is the US Treasury agreement with major airlines which basically provided tens of billion dollars in subsidies uh, to the airlines in return for barring, lay barring layoffs and furloughs before October. And the reason we think that is a mistake is because we think even as of mid-A, it was mid-April, it was quite obvious these jobs weren't coming back uh, at anything nearly like 100%. So if you just look at uh, passenger counts, uh, US airports, they're still down roughly 90% or so. They were already down by about 90% when this policy was implemented. If you look at the announcements from airlines, they've already announced major reductions that says that's in staff that they are anticipating, saying that they don't think things are going back to normal. Boeing has announced that it's uh, cutting jobs, so is its suppliers, because they don't think things are going back to the old situation. So our point is that in, in circumstances like these, employee retention subs subsidies for, say, airline industry workers are just delaying the redeployment of workers and other productive inputs to more effective uses uh, during the crisis and afterwards. So zombie jobs are not a path to recovery. And this doesn't mean there's no possible role for subsidies that encourage the maintenance of employment relationships in certain, uh, in certain respects, but nuanced versions of those policies have not been put in place in the US, uh, at, least, uh, at least not to date. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the discussant is Catherine Abraham. Okay, um, are you hearing me and seeing my slides? We hear you, we don't see the slides. Okay, let's try that again. There we go, it's coming. All right. We're good now? Yes, thank you. Great, thanks. So I, th this was a, it really was trying to make three main points. Um, one is that the large negative shock to many businesses caused by COVID-19 uh, has been accompanied by significant hiring at other businesses. Secondly, that the COVID-19 crisis can be expected to cause significant permanent restructuring. And thirdly, that given these facts that the emphasis with respect to policy should be towards supporting needed reallocation rather than emphasizing the preservation of existing employment relationships. So I'd like to organize my comments around those three main points. Um, Steve's already talked about the evidence related to hiring since the onset of the crisis. Uh, there's a, been a lot of news stories about companies like Amazon and Instacart and others doing a lot of hiring. Um, the uh, responses to the April survey of business uncertainty uh, indicated that at those firms, along with large numbers of layoffs, there was also a lot of hiring. That evidence is consistent with data from the job openings and labor turnover survey and, and other sources. Um, so what should we make of this evidence? I, I think it's very clear that while overall demand fell sharply at the onset of the crisis, there have been some firms that have been experiencing 
real surges in demand. Um, in, in evaluating this evidence, I, I guess I'm, I'm think the results from the survey of business uncertainty are very interesting, but on their own, I wouldn't take them as, as definitive. It turns out that in this case, they're very consistent with other evidence, but I would point out that as Steve indicated, the survey sample size is quite small. Um, the sample frame underrepresents small firms, so there's potential issues of, of coverage bias. And if you, if you look back at the response to the survey, starting from the recruitment stage, going on to actually getting firms to agree to complete surveys, about 42% of the people approached agreed to participate in the panel, and of those, about 62% um, com ever completed one survey. And then on any in, in, in given survey, there may be non-response. So there's some issues about potential non-response. As I said, I don't think that's so important in, in respect to this finding, but it may be important with respect to other uh, results based on, on that survey. So what do we make of the fact that we're seeing layoffs along with hiring? And the point that I would make about that finding is that even in a recession, there's going to be quite a lot of replacement hiring. What we're really interested in if we're thinking about reallocation is non-replacement hiring. Unfortunately, we don't really have measures of that. So what I've done is gone into the JOLTS data and tried to approximate non-replacement hiring. So what I'm calling non-replacement hiring is hires minus quits, if we think that it, somebody quit, the employer would want to replace them, minus other separations. And you can see what that looked like prior to this latest crisis. Um, they, you know, in the Great Recession, we had an increase in layoffs. What I'm calling non-replacement hiring has been quite stable. Well, what happened in this crisis, in the crisis, the current crisis? You can see we had an enormous increase in layoffs, but you know, non-replacement hiring looks a lot like it looked you know, back through history. So I guess I look at these data and I'm not really seeing any obvious evidence here of a lot of reallocation going on in the sense of surges in hiring uh, to offset the big increase in layoffs. But that's maybe not the important thing to think about. The more important thing to think about is going forward, are we going to be seeing a lot of permanent restructuring? And the paper offers, you know, it talks about a lot of changes that have gone on that we might expect to be permanent. The results on potential increases in working from home are particularly interesting, um, though it's not, that's not implying restructuring directly, it's restructuring indirectly related to shifts in spending that people do near where they work. Um, the Baseline estimate um, in the paper is that about 42% of recently laid off workers won't be coming back. And then Steve talked about the jump based on the SVU responses in forward looking excess job reallocation. Um, I do have some questions about this evidence. As I've already indicated, I'm a little bit leery of drawing strong conclusions from the, the SVU data. Um, I, I believe the result about the share of layoffs that people think are going to be temporary versus permanent, what I'm not sure about with respect to that calculation is whether we can take evidence from the past regarding shares of people who end up getting recalled and apply it to this situation. Um, the thing that I'm a little more leery about with the SBU data is this, this forward-looking excess reallocation and how it compares to excess reallocation we've seen in the past. And there, I think the survey composition may be an issue. The, sur the survey underrepresents small firms. The baseline level of reallocation at small firms is much higher than at larger firms. And what I think that means is if the shock has had a similar effect on adding to reallocation at large and small firms, the proportional of, of impact is gonna look a lot bigger at a sample made up of large firms. Um, I guess the second question I have about the, this evidence on permanent restructuring 
is that there is actually just an enormous amount of uncertainty about where we're headed. Um, I hope Nick Bloom doesn't mind. I've, I've taken some data he pointed to in a different presentation in a different venue. Um, if you look at the, the VIX volatility index, um, it shows a, you know, a lot of near-term volatility. We're at very high levels. If you look at um, something that, that Steve and Nick have produced, this news-based economic policy uncertainty index, it's at extremely high levels um, by historical standards. And so the, the point is that if we're, we're really uncertain about where the economy is headed, um, it's very hard to say you know, how, many, how many of those jobs are coming back, how much permanent reallocation there really is gonna be. It's just a very uncertain situation, I think. Um, a final point that I would make about this is that the extent of the eventual reallocation is gonna depend in part on what sort of policies are implemented. So the responses that firms are giving about you know, how many of the jobs they think are gonna be coming back are gonna be based presumably you know, both on what they see going on within the firm and also what they think the economy is gonna look like, which is gonna depend in turn on what they think policy is gonna look like. Um, as the paper notes, a lot of reallocation in normal times occurs within industry and regions. So it's you know, one firm doing a particular thing, going out of business and a new one coming into existence to take its place. If we look at uh, not the paper that was presented this morning, but a, a different paper by Bartik et al. Uh, they present results suggesting that liquidity is an important factor in individuals in businesses projected survival. And what that suggests to me is that the extent of the eventual reallocation that we see is gonna depend a lot on what policy looks like. Um, which brings me to the paper's messages for policy. Um, I may be stating this a, a little bit more baldly than the, the authors actually do in the, in the paper. Um, they talk about some of the provisions of the CARES Act. Um, they are concerned about the $600 a week in federal unemployment benefits that for many people means that their replacement rate is over 100%. Uh, they talk about linking firm aid to employee retention um, there's also a discussion in the paper about what, what Steve, I think, termed legacy features of the U.S. policy landscape that may inhibit uh, reallocation, land use policies, occupational licensing, business regulation. I'm not really going to have anything to say about, about those other than that they're not, this is sort of a general issue, not one that's tied to this specific um, situation that we're facing. So let's think about the the unemployment benefits and the subsidizing employee retention. Um, I would agree that continuing the $600 a week to everyone who's unemployed is not good policy. Um, I, I'm less concerned than the authors are, I think, about the job search effects of unemployment and insurance in a weak, benef in a weak labor market. My reading of the evidence is that in a weak labor market, it doesn't really affect job search and job finding success that much. Um, I would note that the, the re very high replacement rates that are cited in, in the paper don't account for the possible loss of health insurance. But all of that said, as the economy starts to recover, I would not want to have large numbers of unemployment insurance recipients receiving larger incomes when they're not working than when they're, when they're working. Uh, a policy that focused on raising replacement rates rather than giving everyone a flat large benefit would seem preferable to me. I do think, though, that an argument can be made for subsidizing employee retention. And I'm not going to have time to go through this slide, which is adapted from a, a recent policy brief by, by Blanchard, Philippon, and Pisani Ferry. But I think I can make the, the basic point. When would you want to subsidize employee retention? You would want to subsidize employee retention when, if you compare the value of what the workers are producing to the shadow value of their time, the, the, what they're producing exceeds the shadow value of their time, which uh, might well 
not correspond with when it made sense for the firm looking at its own private calculation to keep them on. I guess one reason why I have a different view of this than the authors is that from my perspective, the shadow value of time for laid off workers is really quite low during the current and foreseeable future. Um, if you think about what people who become unemployed do at home, you might think that if they're at home, they're doing all kinds of productive things. Historically, at least, what unemployed workers primarily do with their extra time is they sleep more and they watch more television. Um, the creation of new jobs is likely to lag the destruction of old jobs, so their immediate job prospects are likely to be poor. Um, a, a second consideration is that if firms shut down because they you know, aren't currently viable, even if they would be viable in the long run and then other firms eventually take their place, there's costs to shutting down the old firm and starting the new firm. And then I would also add to that that unemployment has adverse consequences on people's well being that go well beyond their loss of income. Um, being displaced from a job can have very serious long term consequences for affected workers. So, taking all of that into account, I guess I'm more favorably disposed towards for some period of time, continuing to subsidize the maintenance of employment relationships than I think the authors are. So the authors clearly are right that the COVID-19 crisis is gonna to lead to some amount of economic restructuring. It's, it's unclear what the extent and nature of that is going to be. If I think about policy, I, I would say, and I, I don't think anybody would disagree with this as stated here, um, you, you wanna protect adversely affected individuals preserve otherwise viable employment relationships temporarily affected by the crisis and create an environment in which needed reallocation occurs in the medium term. Um, I, I guess as I read the paper, it was really pedal to the metal on moving towards encouraging reallocation and, and I'm not quite prepared to go there. But let me stop, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Catherine. So we're going to open up for discussion now and have about uh, five or 10 minutes of comments from the floor and response from the authors. Um, so I think uh, Olivier Blanchard has a question. We'll start with Olivier. It's extending on what uh, Catherine just, just said. It seems to me it's essential to distinguish between temporary shocks shocks which will almost surely come to an end uh, within a year or two when vaccines or something like this are introduced and the ones which are permanent. And if you think about the ones which will go away when the vaccine is there, then the question is why do you want to basically let workers and firms, you know, firms disappear and workers move if basically what you need at the end is the sector to go back to normal. So it seems to me it's very important to distinguish between the two. The argument for reallocation is very weak in the first case. It's stronger in the second, although I agree with Catherine that putting a lot of people in the unemployment pool at this stage doesn't seem like a great idea. Okay, the question from uh, Shabda, go ahead. Yes, I would like to ask on this uh, liquidity point that Catherine brought up. So uh, purely we going and I, we estimated the bankruptcy rates related to the liquidity shortfall, not in the US, in, in European countries, in 20 countries. And this is very significant. This is based on uh, the their positions at the end of 2019. These are viable firms and they are going to bankrupt because of the liquidity shortfall. Of course, if the shock becomes more and more, and more persistent, it will be hard to separate liquidity from solvency. And then I do understand that point that will, you know, uh, balance it towards your location. But I want to get your views on on this in terms of the U.S. Uh, given the, the tremendous policy action to support the especially small firms' liquidity need. Thank you. Okay. Next question from uh, Daron Asimoglu. Hey guys, uh, so just I think this point was implicit in Catherine's uh, discussion, but I want to put it slightly differently. Suppose we see a lot of reallocation at the moment. That still doesn't mean that it's efficient. That things that look like reallocation may be exactly because 
we are going through an inefficient period and jobs have to be destroyed because of demand shortage or other things. And, and the efficient thing would be for that reallocation not to happen. So I think to show, to argue that this, we should encourage reallocation, you need to first document that this is a reallocation shock in the data as it appears and that that's not due to inefficient business closings and separations. Okay, and uh, John Van Rena next. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Great, so it, it's, a, it's a kind of the same theme in a sense. So I, I, the way I would position the thinking now as we hopefully emerge from lockdown is to try to get this balance correct as best we can from a policy making view between protection and reallocation. And, you know, I'm, as, as economists, we're all totally on board with the reallocation. We all love reallocation. But I think one thing we have learned over the research over the last you know, decade, including Steve's own research, suggesting the fall of reallocation in the US, is that, you know, reallocation is not immediate. It takes a long time to happen. Sometimes people get reallocated to inactivity, and that has a big long-term cost, as uh, Catherine said. So I think getting the balance right between reallocation in the medium and long run and some degree of protection of workers in the shorter run is really important. I, 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 my sense is that you put probably too much of the emphasis on reallocation as we emerge from the, the lockdown period. And, uh, you know, I would, I would kind of want to kind of balance that with some degree of more degree of protection. I think you're, you, you want. Okay. Um, the most popular question in the Q and A was whether Catherine was going to play the drums or not. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll skip that one and uh, let the authors uh, respond to some of the points that were made by the discussant and from the audience. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start and maybe um, my co-authors will join in afterwards. Um, thanks, Catherine, for the comments. Thanks for the, from the audience. I, I think there's less distance between uh, our view and the views that were expressed by Catherine and some of the uh, audience questions um, than appears on the surface. So what the paper takes a stand against is subsidizing employee retention, irrespective of the employer's long-term commercial outlook. Okay. Now that's a mouthful. We don't, don't say it over and over again, but we, you know, I, I put the airline example up there because I think it's clearly not in that category. Okay, on the question of liquidity support, the paper explicitly comes down in favor of liquidity support for businesses. Okay, so you know, there's no there's no disagreement there. Um, on on Daron's point about reallocation not necessarily being efficient, yeah, I, I take that point. Um, that. Part of the reason um, that I quickly went through the slide on um, economic persistence mechanisms is precisely to speak to that issue. We have, for better or worse, gone, undertaken a massive social and economic experiment where people have, um, millions of households have tried online delivery and shopping uh, for the first time for pretty much everything. In my household, we haven't been to a retail outlet, including the grocery store for more than three months. Everything gets delivered to us. So there's a lot of learning by doing both on the customer side, but also on the business side in the delivery. So there's, you know, there's learning there and there's investments in complementary inputs. Those investments by themselves alter what is efficient going forward. Same thing on working from home where I think there may be even uh, larger changes because of the learning by doing because of the experimentation, and there's evidence coming, there's evidence coming online now that most businesses are positively surprised by how, how well work from home works now that they've actually tried it at scale. So these are things we didn't know back in February, and they have implications for what the efficient resource allocation is as well. On the business travel side, again, businesses have been forced to shift to virtual meetings with customers and clients out of necessity. Some of them have learned that it works very well. That will change what is efficient for them to do other words. I didn't have time to talk about it in my remarks, but if you look in the paper, we briefly summarize five or six recent studies that drill into the heterogeneity and stock returns among individual firms uh, in the wake of the pandemic. 
there are several things that come out of there, but by my reading, the most striking one is how favorably the pandemic shock has affected many firms that are well positioned to take advantage of the shift to working from home or either as suppliers of those kind of complementary services or just in conducting their business. You know, one anecdote along those lines, Zoom video, we're using it now, has seen a $50 billion increase in market cap. Okay, obviously that is suggestive that there's an expectation that we're going to be doing a lot more uh, virtual meetings uh, going forward. Um, <clears throat> so I do think that, you know, back to Daron's point, we do have some uh, pretty suggestive evidence that much of the reallocation that we talked about um, is in fact efficient and, and not only probably will happen, but probably uh, should happen. Let, let me just, last thing in the, on the sample. So it's true we have a small sample and you know, it's a challenge that we, we, don't, we don't have the BLS or the census sampling frame to draw from. We are using essentially done in Bradstreet. It's not quite as I think um, concerning as Catherine suggested because what we do is we at the recruitment stage, we can, we can and we do adjust our recruitment contact rates to achieve a balance, a sample that meets our desire with respect to firm size, firm industry, and state. And then we're also doing ex post sample weights to match the industry distribution of activity. Now that's far from perfect um, to be sure, but two things on that. One is this, Nick and I have already fielded with a team of others at Census Bureau, a survey that has the same format as the SBU, but is within the Census Bureau and we have more stuff like that online uh, coming online. And there are discussions underway to try to roll out large scale repeated samples, drawing on the census sampling frame and everything the census can bring to bear to do this. So you might think of this SBU as in some sense a pilot for trying to scale up. Um, we'd be happy if the BLS wanted to get involved in this as well, not just the Census Bureau. And, and, and this, the SBU design has already been imitated in other countries around the world, most notably in the UK, where Nick is involved in that, that project as well. One last point about this. Also on the agenda is to take the SBU micro data, move it inside the Census Bureau, where then we can take the standard approach that many researchers have used, which is to ex post after the fact, construct sampling weights using the Census Bureau universe frame uh, and, and get better versions of the sample statistics that come out of the SBU. So there's lots of work to do there. And uh, we're, we're uh, well, we can excite people to participate in that, in that kind of activity. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks to the authors and to Catherine, the discussant. Uh, we'll take a minute or less. We're just going to flip over to the next uh, set of authors and discussants. So we'll have the um, slide flip over and to start Jim, the next paper. Yeah. Jim, you can go ahead and uh, share your slides and start your presentation. Okay, are we uh, are we good? Can you see the slides? We can, and we can hear you. Okay, great. So uh, thanks very much. Um, okay, so uh, I'm talking today about work with David Bakayi at UCLA, uh, Emmanuel Farhi, a colleague of mine in the Harvard Economics Department, and Mike Minna, who is an epidemiologist at the Chan School of Public Health. Uh, so let me just get started by uh, looking at um, looking at what uh, the current situation is in terms of uh, death rates and cases in the United States. So <clears throat> on the left is New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, where death rates and cases have been uh, declining quite steadily. And we're now in uh, different phases uh, or medium or early phases of opening up uh, 
the rest of the US, as everybody's aware, what we're seeing is declining deaths, although most recently it's kind of a plateau in deaths, but most notably we're seeing uh, an increase in confirmed cases, so you know, test positive tested testing results, which raises the question of a second wave. And if we do have a second wave, what are the policies for that? So um, I think I'm gonna be able to summarize the paper in just a couple of slides. Uh, and I, I will say that uh, just I guess the brief, the brief synopsis is that we have a fairly optimistic view, which is that uh, it is um, the second wave does not have to be, <clears throat> it certainly could be a W-shaped recession uh, leading to long-term unemployment and a large number of deaths, uh, but it doesn't have to be. So we're gonna do some simulations in some version of an SIR model with some economics accounting linked in, and I'll explain that in a minute. The chart that you see on the left is one that we're gonna be going through. It's this format that we'll have. Uh, and in this particular case, we happen to have an unemployment rate, which is pretty high. Uh, we have a second wave. So the second wave of deaths is just around the corner. It's a plateau over the course of the summer. And then it starts to uh, increase uh, in, the, in the fall as there's more opening up. This reflects, this, this reflects a variety of things, but, uh, but basically uh, people getting tired of, uh, of being in lockdown mode and, uh, and an overall opening up. I, we will all discuss the way that the unemployment rate stays high. We have a control rule set up in there and that can either represent a conservative a government that is taking conservative actions in terms of keeping trying to trying to uh, fight this with uh, economic lockdowns, or alternatively, you can interpret it as individuals who are concerned about going out uh, when uh, the when when deaths are actually increasing. So the question is, can something be done about this that would have a better outcome, both in terms of deaths and the unemployment rate, that is quantitatively plausible? And uh, our basic message is that there's no silver bullet, but, it, uh, but certainly uh, it, is, it seems to be possible based on uh, the parameterizations and the calibrations and the sensitivity analysis that we've done. So on the right, what we have is we have a governor or a population that recognizes that something is going wrong, that a second wave looks like it's about to emerge and uh, it, has, has a temporary concern about going back to work and going shopping, but most importantly, takes a number of additional precautionary measures that are not related to economic shutdowns. So in particular, there's a testing and quarantine program. It's not at all a perfect testing and quarantine program. It's, a, it's actually a pretty imperfect one that's rolled out. There's enhanced protections for the elderly, <clears throat> some of which are already uh, most of many of which are already outlined in C uh, Center of Medicare and Medicaid study uh, uh, services guidelines, but uh, perhaps not fully implemented. Uh, there'll be it would be increased wearing of masks and personal distancing, so uh, required mask wearing, such as been ordered or is contemplated in a number of different states. But leaving businesses largely open, and so I'll, uh, there's a there's a little caveat on that largely, and I'll get to that. So, uh, and importantly, schools are staying open in this scenario. So I think for this optimistic view uh, to be one that you think has any credibility, I need to convince you that the model has some credibility. So the main task that I'm gonna spend the next, uh, whatever, seven, five minutes on is trying to convince you that the modeling effort that led here is using the best available evidence that we can trying to calibrate things as well as possible based on the economics and the epidemiological literature at hand. Um, okay, so let me, let me describe the model. We're looking at a 66 sector economic model uh, and a five married to a five age group uh, SIR model that's extended to have an incubation period, that's the exposed component, a quarantine period, and then uh, also deaths. So, uh, Caroline Bucky suggested using what she called SIR regression, and that's actually, that's how we're gonna approach this. Um, Michael Krimer talked about heterogeneity of contacts, and that's one way to say heterogeneity of R0. That's the a main reason that we have five different ages. Kids are different than adults. Kids have tons of contacts at school. They also seem to be, uh, the, the evidence so far is that they do not transmit the virus as much as, uh, as adults do. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, there's the elderly who are particularly exposed uh, and, and threatened uh, by the virus uh, and uh, have the highest, highest death rates. So the 5-H SER QRD model uh, is able to distinguish among those. And then we have, we build in a variety of time varying specifications of non-pharmaceutical interventions, some of which are economic and some of which are non-economic. And I'll go through those in due course. Finally, we close the model using a control rule. Control rule, we talk about it in the paper as a governor. I think that one of the lessons which we all know uh, from the previous uh, papers uh, is that uh, is that these control rules are man the man government mandates are only part of the story. If you close schools, kids don't go to school. On the other hand, the lockdowns were uh, were were uh, had, had minor causal components because people had already started self isolating out of fear. Another way to say that is you can allow restaurants to open, but that doesn't necessarily mean people will go out to eat. So we have a decision maker that could be thought of as a governor or an individual uh, explicitly following CDC guidelines in terms of how to modulate their behavior. There is a vast related literature. Uh, and it is exciting that so many people are working on this, and uh, that is a great opportunity for the profession to triangulate on what we hope can be some helpful policies to try to avoid a long-term unemployment and a long-term uh, malaise. Um, the core feature, a core feature of our, of our uh, model is uh, that different people of different ages have different contacts. So this is summarized in what's referred to as contact matrices. We have some contact matrices up on the top here. The normal status quo contact matrix, which is estimated, it's described in the paper, is here on March 2nd. So we have daily contact matrices. Uh, you can see that the kids were going to school and they have a lot of contacts with the other kids. They also have contacts with their parents uh, and the parents are going to work and they're going to other activities and the ball game and so forth. And so in this group, there's a lot of contacts. Contacts become less as you get older simply because people don't move around as much. So the 75 plus, you, I don't know how well this is coming out on the screen, but there's reasonable numbers of contacts where 45 to 64 year olds then go visit their parents or maybe their healthcare workers and, they visit and they, they're providing services to the elderly. This is what the contact matrix we estimate looked at, uh, looked like on April 15th. So basically schools were closed. There were not nearly as many people going to work and there were a lot fewer contacts with the elderly, although notably there are still pretty many contacts among the workers. And then here, once you, once you see this, you realize we can manipulate some of these cells to, once we have calibrations, to think about different counterfactuals. So here's a counterfactual where it's an age-based go back to work policy. So the 65 year olds don't go back to work and uh, we have additional protections in place for the elderly. So there's fewer contacts with the elderly. So maybe you don't go visit your elderly parents if they're in a continuing care re retirement community or a life care community. Uh, and, we still, uh, and we still don't have the kids going back to school. Uh, some of these contact reductions were able to, I wouldn't quite say measure, but we're able to calibrate using these mobility indexes that we've seen the Caroline Bucky and uh, the, uh, the other papers in that session we're talking about. So we use those to calibrate the contact matrices. Other aspects, we simply don't have any data on. So we don't have data on masks, on mask wearing. I mean, it would have been, I suppose, interesting to see if we could have gotten CCTV data on mask wearing, but that uh, instead what we're going to do is we're going to estimate a flexible functional form that's going to indicate what additional protections you might take beyond contact reductions that would reduce the transmission of the virus. And that's a, this thing called a phi, phi factor, a flexible functional form in this described in the paper. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and I should just say one important piece of this is our contact matrices are the sum of three things. You can, eat, you can meet people at work, or you can meet people at home, or you can meet people in your other activities. And that gives us flexibility. And if you're at work, you can, uh, there's 66 different sectors. And so different sectors have different degrees of contacts and proximities. You know, uh, contact and proximity in fishing and forestry is very different than wholesale trade, which is very different than uh, home health care. 
Uh, we, est we, we calibrate some of the parameters, or we get some of the parameters from the epidemiological literature on age-dependent infection fatality rates and, and other things like that. Uh, we fit it to seven-day moving average of U.S. deaths. Uh, this is an estimated plot of the effective R or effective R0, if you want to call it that. This is from our model using that phi parameter and then the calibrated mobility indexes. And then this is a non-parametric estimate. It's a uh, whatever, local uh, non-parametric estimate. Um, Okay, and then we have, uh, I, I described the control rule. We have two different scenarios, fast and slow. And then uh, we have a variety of different NPIs. And so I'm going to talk about those in order. I will mention that in the paper, we just, just uh, to go through uh, in some detail about a GDP to risk index and consider sectoral openings that prioritize certain businesses. When we took that to the model, it didn't seem to make, it was a second order deal. So I'm not gonna spend much time on it here. Okay, uh, let me just walk you through some of the scenarios. So here's the case you want to avoid. It's a W-shaped recession. We uh, have, the, have a uh, reopening, which then gets out of control. We have a second wave. Even if you're the fast governor, or even if you don't particularly mind, you get a little bit skittish and you have some shutdowns. So we have the first wave of unemployment, and then we have a second wave of unemployment. At this, we have the rather optimistically end the year at about 7% unemployment rate, which, um, which is higher than a lot of forecasts, but we do so having had 444,000 deaths. So what happens if you just slam on the brakes and you cut all of the, and you cut down on contacts at work? So you reduce the contacts at work you, uh, and, and you, you sort of deal with this by economic lockdowns. And what you do, what, what you see happens is that the unemployment rate stays up at 15%. You actually do say, uh, do reduce deaths. So if you compare the two of these things, the death, deaths are lower. So instead of 440,000 deaths by the end of the year, we only have 370,000 deaths by the end of the year. But the main point is that this is not a first order solution, that this, is, this, this mitigates somewhat. Uh, if all you do is lock down the economy, that mitigates uh, contacts. But the thing is, there's still lots of contacts that are happening in other circumstances. You haven't put your masks back on. This by itself is only a piece. Well, so I'm gonna walk through a number of different uh, scenarios. One of this here, what if you required working from home? Now, if you require working from home, uh, and this is all going to be with the same control rule. So we're going to be sort of pro opening the economy. If you work from home, you have fewer contacts. So you're going to be less spread of the virus. What that allows the governor to do or the shoppers to do is do a little bit more shopping. Well, as they do a little more shopping, there's a second round phenomenon here, which is a little bit more shopping means you're going to actually have more deaths. So the deaths, there's sort of a rebound effect of deaths. But even after you net that out, we've got a lower unemployment rate. And, uh, and, we've, um, and the deaths have been reduced by about 40,000. Not a silver bullet, potentially a useful thing to do. Um, here, what if you do this uh, marginal GDP to risk index? You can't see any difference between the two plots. So that, that was a second order deal or third order deal. What if you don't allow any uh, workers that are uh, uh, younger than uh, 65 to go back to work? Well, that actually reduces deaths too by about 25,000 but that's a second order thing. What if you do all three of those, which is you have a sectoral prioritization, work from home uh, if you are able to, and, uh, and you're not allowing any more 65 plus on site. And that actually also makes a difference, but you haven't stopped the second wave. So you basically took out a lot of a big arsenal here of economic, of economic uh, interruptions and, uh, and, uh, and it hasn't stopped the second wave. So we're gonna look at non-economic NPIs. First one is what if you say nobody goes back to school? That actually makes a difference, doesn't make much of a difference. And that's because based on the current epidemiological literature, the kids don't have as much transmission, uh, it, both from adult to kid and kid to kid and kid to adult. So uh, you sort of don't, don't see that as a big effect. Uh, what if you have enhanced protections for age 75 plus? So some of those are potentially in progress already, although I think uh, my understanding is that there's underfunding and staffing problems and capacity problems at some of the nursing homes to actually implement the CMS guidelines, but some of these are in process and that makes a difference. But if you have a 10% quarantine rate, well, 10% quarantine rate sounds low. I would argue that that's actually pretty high. 
if 40% of the population is symptomatic and half of them actually bother to get a test so that 20% are tested and detected and then half of them actually bother to quarantine, then you're at a 10% quarantine, right? So, or a 10% isolation, right? So that makes a difference, it's not a silver bullet. What if we go back to wearing masks, not all the way back to where we were in April, but if we go a little ways back towards April, that actually makes a big difference, masks and social differencing. What if we do all of those things together, 10% social, 10% quarantine, mask and social distancing and protections of the elderly? Uh, that's where we wanna be. So it's the bottom line. Um, I'm out of time and I suppose I should probably try to obey our rules. Um, there's a lot of things that we could do here. Uh, we have not done any cost benefit analysis. Uh, we have a little bit on that in the paper. Let me just make one comment, which is that I think that the, the, there's a, there is a thread through the literature on cost benefit analysis using a value of statistical life, trying to say, well, what is the economic cost versus the death cost? What we're trying to say is that that's the wrong either or that we can have through disciplined use of non-economic NPIs, we can both reduce deaths and make room for the economy to reopen. And it seems like now is a good time to start. Okay, so thank you. All right, thanks, Jim. Uh, the discussion is Daron Asamoglu. Daron, you have your slides to share? Yep. Great. Perfect. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so it was a pleasure to read and uh, discuss this paper. Uh, you know, I don't think the topic needs much introduction and Jim already did it. You know, uh, this is a huge public health emergency and uh, the cause of uh, the greatest US recessions in the Great Depression. So some sort of return to normalcy is absolutely necessary, but how? And uh, a major concern exactly like Jim articulated is whether this is gonna cause a second wave and that will depend on policies, but smart policies perhaps might help. And this is where the current paper comes in. So it develops an extended SIR, SEIR model with five age groups, 66 sector, uh, careful calibration of most of the parameters and considers various uh, reopening scenarios as well as simple feedback of local policies on a feedback controller type approach of the governors that respond to unemployment and death. Uh, the bottom line is that smart reopening is feasible and can save both the economy and lives, but of course the details do matter and that's what I'm gonna talk about. So in my opinion, this is an important contribution to the policy discussion and it is a rich and ambitious paper and I, I believe the paper is going in the right direction. But the question is, you know, what is the absolute aim? is whether the paper is an academic contribution or a uh, policy piece. And I think it's uh, it, it could make progress in both of those. It's not as well calibrated as it should be either as an academic contribution or as a shovel ready for policymakers. And I'm gonna try to argue that. So first on the academic contribution, of course, some may say, this is not a priority. This is our hour of need, but this will not be the last pandemic. This epidemiology economics uh, intersection will be important, will remain important, but even more importantly, I think, I think unless we distill the qualitative insights appropriately, these contributions will not have impact on the policy debate. So there, the question is, what are the robust qualitative new lessons? And, and I wanna sort of put this in the context a little bit of the past work in particular, since my work, my thinking is colored by, with my, by my work with, uh, with Dr. Chernozukov, Ivan Werning, and Mike Winston, I'm gonna sort of uh, put it in that context. And then I will come back to issues of policy from there. So essentially uh, the paper that uh, Victor, Mike, Ivan, and I wrote can be viewed as a special case of the current paper with one little exception, but that little perhaps matters. We don't have sectors. We have only three age groups, young, middle age, and old. Uh, just like them, we allow for a contract matrix, but we start with a uniform, which I'm gonna show one one second how the contract matrix matters. But one notable difference, we consider optimal policy uh, and focus on Pareto frontiers. I think that's actually quite important because uh, multiple waves of infections is actually a feature of some of the early papers from the epidemiology literature like Ferguson et al. And the question remains as to whether they are inevitable or they, whether they are because of policy mistakes. 
So bunching in suboptimal policy, I think, harms our ability to draw the right qualitative conclusions, in my opinion. So here is a summary of our paper, and I want to do that as a way of transitioning to the current paper's discussion. So you can express everything in terms of changes in the Pareto frontier. Every point here is an optimal policy, but for different trade-off between excess deaths and excess economic damages. Uh, excess deaths are on the horizontal axis, PDV of economic losses on the vertical axis. The origin is where you want to be, no excess deaths, no economic damages. And if you just use uniform policies, which is sort of what some of the early epidemiology and some of the early economic uh, uh, contributions did, the Pareto frontier would be these red dashed lines. And various different types of targeted policies, I'll talk about some of them in the context of the current paper, are, can essentially be viewed as shifting you in to a lower and therefore preferable Pareto frontier. And in particular, here is uh, focusing on the point that we show here as a dot. That point, a dot, would be one that says you should never let fatalities rise to more than 0.2% of adult uh, population in the United States using early uh, R0 and early numbers, which are uh, which don't take into account some of the things that we want to take into account, just like Jim and company do very successfully, such as face mask wearing, better testing, better isolation. But without those, uh, you know, the way you could do that is with a high economic costs. So you would need to do a lot of uh, a lot of lockdowns. Why? Well, because the relevant parameter in the SIR model, as Jim explained, is really a product of two things. One is what's the probability of infection conditional on contact, and what are the contacts? So if we cannot change infection conditional on contact, the only way we can reduce the spread of the disease, the R0 or the effective reproduction rate later, is by reducing contacts, which involves the economic lockdowns. Now, that has significant economic costs. So it might cost like a 15, 20% recession in one year and over a year and a half is even more economic cost. So what, what if you do smarter policies, just like the authors of this paper advocate? So one that we can easily see again from the optimal policy perspective is to allow different lockdowns on different groups that by their vulnerabilities. As Jim already hinted at, if you look at the over 65, or it's even worse for the over 75 group, their case fatality, fatality conditional on infection is 60 times uh, or more greater than the younger groups. So optimal policy takes that into account and says, well, you have a stricter lockdown on the older groups, therefore you can actually let the younger groups go back to work. Actually, the gains from that are quite significant uh, in, in our analysis, and that's a qualitatively robust feature as like the shift of the Pareto frontier shows. And that actually reflects some differences in the modeling, which I, I don't wanna get into here because time is short. I wanna talk about a few other things, but I think that's important and, and I'll, uh, we, can, we can follow up on that in the discussion. It really depends on how you model working from home and the lockdown on the older groups. But network structure matters a lot. And, and the network structure matters a lot, both in terms of giving you new options, but also in terms of what different types of policies achieve. In particular, the polymod data that, uh, the, the, uh, that Jim and uh, co-authors use has significantly lower contacts for the order, older groups. And I'll come back to that. When that's the case, you can actually do a lot more, even without targeted lockdowns. And in fact, here I'm showing you the data from the BBC pandemic, which is much less uh, extreme in terms of the lower contacts of the older group. Even in that case, you see the optimal contact starts releasing the older group out of their lockdown. Why is that? Well, because when they interact among themselves, once you kill the infection among the older group sufficiently, you can let them in. You can let them sort of interact, go back to consuming and go back to some of their work. Of course, it doesn't last because once the infection builds up within that group, you need to lock them up again. So actually, the quadratic nature of matching in these models implies that non-monotonicities could happen. That's another reason for actually thinking about optimal policy. So now from this slide, what are the academic lessons from the current paper? I think the most important one is that smart reopening is better. And 
a lot of that is really comes to non-economic, non-pharmacological interventions. And I think Jim was very clear on this. I think this was uh, uh, clearer in the second version of their paper and the discussion is even clearer on that. The presentation was even clearer on that. But one problem is that of course, these are non-economic. So exactly in what way they interact with the economics is, is important. So why do we need an economics model? So what are the general qualitative lesson we can learn from simpler models, for example, one that doesn't have any economic component and just as a pure epidemiological model. And you say, let's look at the effects of face masks. So I think those are sort of interesting discussions. What we learn from the economics uh, epidemiological interaction. Another question that's relevant for me, given uh, how I've come to this is that now that we have a five times 66 model, do we really need that? Can we have a lower dimension of representation without sectors, for example, that gives the same results? You know, the, the results in the current version hint perhaps that's actually true because, uh, because the GDP to risk ratio, which Jim did not discuss, doesn't bring much gain. So I think that's uh, something that may need to be investigated a little bit more. But I'm actually very keen on the sectoral structure. I really liked the paper first when I saw it because of this sectoral structure. So let me actually talk a little bit about the GDP the risk ratio, even though Jim didn't. I think that's an important innovation of the paper, but I think they need to dig deeper. What is the GDP to risk ratio? I didn't put the mathematical formula here because I thought Jim would present it, but it's the ratio of the derivative of GDP to a policy divided by the derivative of R0, the initial reproduction rate of the disease from reopening. This is actually conceptually very useful, but actually it's important to emphasize that it's not a sufficient statistic. What is R0? And you have a network-like model, R0 is the largest eigenvalue of the Jacobian of the dynamical system over the graph. So this is a very important concept, but it actually had, doesn't have a lot of the relevant information. In particular, it doesn't have information about the mixing properties of the induced Markov chain. What does that mean? So let me try to illustrate what it means uh, in words. So take two uh, societies. Imagine they have an island structure, which means that people, just like in the polymod data, I think it's a little bit too much in the polymod data, but the old interact with old, kids interact with kids. That's like an island structure. And the islands themselves are weakly connected to the rest of society. Then R0 approximately is the same if two islands have exactly the same internal structure. But when you think about it a little bit, you'll see that that's actually not what you wanna capture because the mixing properties are determined by how those islands are connected to the rest of the graph. So what are they, what does that depend on? Well, that actually depends on the rest of the eigenvalues. In fact, it's determined, it's, 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 uh, it's dominated by the second largest eigenvalue. So you can easily build better measures than the GDP to risk ratio, and it may actually give you a little bit more mileage. So I think those are some interesting issues. So another, well, you have about a minute left. Okay, I have about a minute left. And in the, another, in that minute, let me actually uh, say what I would really benefit from the current paper is that if there is a better discussion or a more detailed discussion of why these choices, like for example, I think the current paper notes but doesn't model nursing homes. 40 to 50% of deaths so far in nursing homes. So why not model that? Actually, you can do that if you have a Markov chain over the graph that has both slow mixing and fast mixing. I think that would be an inter interesting uh, thing. Face masks, I think they are super important. I would like to understand more. Uh, for example, recent evidence shows that ICU nurses at Mass General have 2% infection rates. And they're dealing with uh, COVID patients and it's just face masks. So I think, uh, you know, is it just about face masks? How much can we get just with face masks, which is something we can deal with with simple policies? I think more can be done on the education metrics. And also, as I pointed out, why not look at optimal policies? The finally, uh, what can a non-economist policymaker learn from this paper? I think here the paper can vastly improve its appeal by getting rid of the governors and the feedback group. I think if you take these results to a non-policy, non-economist policy maker, you cannot say that these are the optimal policies. They are the optimal policies constrained by the behavior of governors, but we're trying to change the behavior of the governor. I mean, I'm all in favor of inc incorporating political economy into our analysis, but I don't think this is a good way of incorporating political, uh, uh, political economy. And I think for the policy makers, you need to have really simple messages. 
what are going to be the simple messages? GDP to the risk ratio, face masks. I think if the message is actually it's non-economic, non-pharmacological interventions coming from economists, I'm not sure how effective it will be rather than we just go for one sort of thing. Okay, is it face masks together with its economic interactions and how we can change the economy? And then I would actually also, I think Jim and co-authors are ideally suited to thinking a little bit more about how confident are, are should we be in some of these numbers when there is parameter instability and uncertainty, because that's a classic Bayesian or robust control type of issue. Finally, I think there are a lot of things here for us to think much more about. I think this relates to the issues that Steve Davis talked about. There are going to be social changes that are uh, long lasting, how we shop, how we work, how we interact. There's a lot of evidence that firms are going much more in the direction of automation. Then there will be sort of political changes. These are of course beyond the scope of the current paper, but I think are useful for us to think in the terms of the economics, epidemiology and social science perspective. Again, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, great work and thanks for giving me the opportunity to discuss it. Thank you. Great, thanks Duran. Um, we have about five minutes, so I'm gonna take just a few questions from the floor and then um, I'm gonna squeeze Jim's response time a little bit. <laughs> um, so let's start with Justin Wolfers um, and, uh, and then we'll go to Alan Auerbach. So Alan, you can get ready. Justin? Yeah, um, sort of globally, but actually seriously, I wanted to push Jim on Duran's last point, which is where are standard errors? Um, Obviously, in lots of contexts, we don't care that much because when stuff is linear, it all averages out. But, you know, you miss R by a little bit on one side and we explode in one direction. You get it a little bit on the other. And so that's got to create a tremendous uh, bias toward being conservative. Um, and it would be you know, useful to hear you say more about that. Okay. Thanks. Um, Alan and then uh, Thomas Philippon. Uh, thanks very much. I, I enjoyed the paper and I also enjoyed the discussion. And I wanted to pick up uh, uh, on a point related to one of uh, Daron's last comments, uh, which is uh, when you're thinking about uh, how to model the behavior of uh, different agents under uh, different rules, uh, economic and non-economic interventions, um, it would seem that it's important, uh, even though you're trying to come up with policies that, that are better and, and to uh, uh, target those policies, be useful to think about the feasibility of these in a broader context. I mean, one of the reasons why we're observing um, surges in various uh, parts of the country right now is that people have basically decided they can't uh, sit in their house anymore. Um, and so when we have social distancing, uh, or even wearing masks when people feel that that's somehow an, uh, an infringement on their personal freedom. Um, that that modifies limits, but it also alters the trade-off among different policies because some policies that you've looked at may seem less attractive, but they also may be more feasible in terms of what can actually be accomplished beyond simply providing information about what you might want to do. Okay, um, Thomas Philippon and then Austin Goolsby. Yeah, hi. Um, no, yeah, nice paper and, and discussion. I just want to point out that even if uh, risks are very different across age groups, it doesn't mean that you want to impose uh, lockdowns on the older uh, people. Because when you think about policy, what matters is not the level, it's the difference between what people would do by themselves and what you would like them to do in equilibrium. And it's very clear if you think about the data that old people have the lowest externality rate because they have low contact rate and high personal risk. So by themselves, they're gonna be very careful. The young, even though they are not very risky, they are the opposite. So even in a model where the risk is tilted toward the older generation, that does not imply that the policy should target this group. In fact, it's very likely it would be the opposite and you would still tell uh, young people not to go to bars together, even though ultimately you want to protect the old. Okay, I'm gonna give uh, Austin the last question here and uh, then we'll go back to the authors. Uh, my my question or encouragement to you, Jim, is to think about this issue of in, in the in the data from China, the the highest infection rates happened at home, and you got them from family members. And age is certainly a risk factor, but so is obesity, and so are a series of medical conditions. And 
you could plausibly make the case that 50% of the US population is at a high risk group, if you start thinking about that. And then the fact that they live with one another makes it seem like that targeted lockdown, it's, it's kind of hard to see how, how it works. And I wonder if even just on a simplest uh, measure, if you went to the CPS or others and found sectors of where people work and, and what sector their spouse works in, if you could have some, the, the R not value for people in different sectors might, uh, might vary on those grounds. Thanks, Austin. Uh, Jim and other speakers, can you guys take literally a, a minute to wrap things up? Uh, yes, yeah, so let me just say two quick things. So in terms of the lockdown of the elderly, I think uh, the biggest, uh, the, the, uh, one of the places where there's been the biggest amount of deaths has been nursing homes. So that really is not a self-isolation issue. That's sort of a nursing home administration and capacity issue. Uh, on the optimal control, so Jerome and I, we've gone back and forth on this. I think that there's just, uh, uh, I'll just, since I have no time, I will just say I disagree. And I think that there's virtue to actually modeling people following CDC guidelines in these complex circumstances. I suppose, you know, we, we, I, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, so, um, Mike, do you have anything you want to add to this? No, I, not, not with the time. I, I think uh, it was a great conversation here. Uh, Emmanuel? Uh, I just wanted to say uh, one thing very quickly, which is, so in the spirit of trying to make things a little simpler, we've made a few choices that probably actually uh, reduce the economic impact of the lockdowns. And we have a short discussion of this in the paper. So the trade-off is probably worse than the one that we highlight and we have a way of exploring that. So, you know, you can worsen the cost of lockdowns easily by 20 or 40% by bringing in more realistic pictures like complementarities or Keynesian spillovers and things like that. But that doesn't change the overall message of the paper, which I think at the end of the day is very simple, is there's, there are not that many contacts that can lead to infections in the workplace. And so, you know, uh, the big game is to try to reduce these other contacts. And there's a question as to how effective we can be about this, uh, how much of that is gonna be driven by policy versus induced uh, and that kind of stuff. But that's where the real money is uh, in some sense. And I think that's a very simple message that uh, comes out of what we do. And maybe we can do an even better job with the, the contacts and bringing new evidence and everything. But that comes out pretty robustly of what we've looked at. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, terrific session. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.